everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Had I known that I was going to be in flashing lights and on Facebook Live, I would have had my hair done and my makeup done. It's a little intimidating. <laughs> I'm just going to start my timer here. I have a tendency to maybe go on a little too long sometimes if I have the opportunity. So thank you, Kelly, for the very kind introduction. And um, it's just really my pleasure to be here today. I have only been to Swift Current a couple of times. And when I was offered the opportunity to come here, I thought, well, of course my phone's ringing. It's a decline. OK. Um, I, I just thought. You know, in the honor of being, it being Mental Health Week and in honor of some of the nurses that I work with and it being Nurses Week and especially um, Psychiatric Nurses Day today, I'm just very, very um, pleased to be here. Uh, I've, does this sound okay or am I shuffling? There's my other phone ringing. <laughs> so maybe I'll explain my role a little bit. So I am, all those words really come down to the fact that I am at the beck and call at a group of psychiatrists. And so I work very closely with, with psychiatrists to help patients with their medications. Um, and that can be for a variety of different um, conditions. It can be for depression, it can be for anxiety, it can be for psychosis. And these patients can be in the hospital or they can be in the community And um, because medications can get very, very complicated, especially when um, Parkinson's disease, as all of you in the room are likely very aware. So I have been involved with a number of patients with Parkinson's disease. It's been my pleasure. And I can I, I do have hands-on experience. Uh, I don't consider myself an expert, um, but I am very familiar with, with just how complicated the, the illness can be and how complicated the, medica the medication management can be as well. All right, so let's move forward. Um, the topic, uh, uh, today's topic is understanding the, medical, the mental health complexities of Parkinson's disease. And I'm really going to focus, I mean, this could be a very broad subject. I'm going to try to narrow it down a little bit. So my objectives today are to describe some of the most common mental health complications associated with Parkinson's disease. Um, I am going to provide most emphasis on depression and anxiety. And then I'm going to outline uh, why it is really important to, to detect and to treat these conditions when they arrive, arise. And then I'm going to explain the general treatment approach for these conditions as well, in very general terms. Obviously, um, everybody in the room may have uh, very specific questions about their own care. Um, or maybe of, of a loved one. And it's going to be very difficult for me to address everybody's individual needs, but I, I just hope that I can provide a general enough information um, to help uh, provide it, an overview. And then obviously, I, I hope that you will ask questions. Um, I'm going to ask to reserve them maybe till the end. I'm hoping to maybe talk for about 40 minutes and then we'll have at least 20 minutes for questions. So. That way, um, we'll have some flow, and then we can have um, plenty of time for questions at the end. Okay, this slide is a little bit difficult to read, but I'm going to walk you through um, as best I can. All these little bubbles or balloons um, on the slide basically emphasize, um, I just turned it off, um, different aspects of or different illnesses that can happen. Uh, psychosis is one balloon. That is one of the psychiatric manifestations that can happen in, in Parkinson's disease. Um, and that some, can sometimes be because of medications. <laughs> Someone decided to water the lawn. <laughs> um, that wasn't a hallucination that I was experiencing. Um, so hallucinations can happen. Um, they typically are, are visual. But we can also see um, um, other things like, um, uh, yeah, so that they can happen as part of the illness. They can also happen as part of um, medication side effects. Um, another balloon is apathy or anhedonia. And apathy can happen in the early stages of, of Parkinson's disease. It can happen later. 
can be also related to medications. It is, is uh, basically defined as lack of motivation. And anhedonia is considered to be lack of interest. And why I'm going to define these right now is because they can overlap with signs or symptoms of depression that I'll talk about later. Um, the, the other thing that, um, that can happen is um, has to do with um, some impulse control disorders um, that are usually related to medications as side effects, such as um, compulsive buying, gambling, spending, that sort of thing. Um, I won't talk about that very much, but if someone wants to talk about it in the question period, I certainly can do that. And then there's um, also an element of dementia that can happen in Parkinson's disease. And that's certainly not the focus of the talk today, but we can, we can talk about that later. And then there is anxiety and depression. And those are the, the last two um, balloons. And so the anxiety, I would say by far, is the most common symptom that, um, psychiatric symptom that is reported in the, in the literature. Uh, with about 60% in most of the studies that I've come across. Um, and um, it can happen in any, any point of the illness. Often it, it, it can even be reported before Parkinson's disease is even diagnosed. Depression. Um, I have read reports where it's, it's been reported to be um, anywhere from 5% up to 90%. Um, it's very poorly... Um, I would say there, there's a lot of um, variability in, in, some, in some of the studies, uh, depending on where they were, where they were done, what they were looking for, um, what diagnostic criteria was used in the studies, um, and there's lots of different reasons why depression can happen, um, and I'll get into that in, in some of the following slides. And but but we do know that it, it certainly is a common occurrence in Parkinson's disease. Okay, so some bigger letters for you to look at. <laughs> so anxiety and depression um, are, are definitely common symptoms in Parkinson's disease. Um, when I talk about symptoms, um, basically what I'm saying is that they are, a, a person can have some symptoms of depression, some symptoms of anxiety, but they may not have a disorder. And I'm going to explain what a disorder is in a little, a little while to differentiate what the, what, why there is a difference between symptoms and a disorder. Um, but it's, it's very, very common for people to have one or two symptoms of depression, but not necessarily have the full disorder and also for anxiety. Um, as I've mentioned already, the prevalence so, um, of depression is, is variable, but I would say about the average is about 35 percentage, um, and for anxiety disorders, it's, 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 or it is more high, uh, about 60 percent. And it's more common to have um, anxiety and depression in Parkinson's disease than it is in any other neurological condition. So that says a lot. And it's one of the most frequent non-motor symptoms in Parki in, of Parkinson's disease. And, we, and I know that you're all very well educated on the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease based on all the materials that I've seen from Parkinson's Canada. It's one of the biggest points that I want to, rec to um, bring forward today is that it's, it's most <coughs> definitely under-recognized, under-identified, and certainly under-treated, um, and more about that. So even back when James Parkinson came up with the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, um, there was, a, there was a, an essay uh, called Essay on the Shaking Palsy. Have you come across this? Yeah. Where he acknowledged an association between Parkinson's disease and depressed mood right from the very beginning. And in this essay, he cited his colleague, Dr. Maddie, who referred to a patient with the following words, a more melancholy object I, ha I never beheld. And it just speaks to how close-knit depression 
or the, uh, the mast um, depression um, and, and um, Parkinson's disease really is. So I found this quite fascinating when I was doing my reading. Now this slide isn't easy to read. I'm going to speak about it. Um, how depression as a disorder is defined is based on what's called a, a DSM-5, which is a Diagnostic and Statistical Net. Um, um, it's very intimidating to know you're being recorded, by the way. <laughs> it's just, it's a, it has a whole other element. A Diagnostic and Statistical Manual um, for Psychiatric Disorders. And this is um, basically the guidebook for how psychiatrists diagnose illness disorders. Um, and it's a list of criteria, and a, a patient needs to meet this criteria, um, at least some of the criteria, in order to say that a patient has depression. And so I'm going to, to list some of the criteria for you. So, um, and of course I have it pretty far away. Let's see, I have it in front of me here, just so that I don't misspeak. Okay, so... Basically, to meet the diagnosis of depression, an individual must be experiencing five or more of the following symptoms for the same two-week period of at least, um, and at least one of the symptoms needs to be depressed mood or loss of interest or pleasure. Okay, so a consecutive period of at least two weeks and one of them has to be apathy or anhedonia. So automatically, apathy or anhedonia, which is the loss of interest or, um, or loss of pleasure, automatically kind of fits in. So um, depressed mood is defined um, basically as depressed mood most of the day, nearly all day, for two weeks, two consecutive weeks. Second criteria is markedly diminished interest or pleasure in all or almost all activities most of the day, every day. Number three is significant weight loss or when you're not dieting or weight gain or decrease or increase in weight or appetite nearly every day. A slowing down, so four, is a slowing down of thoughts or reduction of physical movement observed by others that's not merely subjective of restlessness or being slowed down. This one's a little difficult with Parkinson's because the motor symptoms can, um, can, can mask this. this. The fifth one is fatigue or loss of energy nearly every day. And this usually isn't attributed to something else, so there, that has to be teased out. And feeling of worthlessness or excessive, inappropriate guilt nearly every day. Diminished ability to think or concentrate or feeling indecisive nearly every day. Recurrent thoughts of death, recurrent suicidal thoughts without a specific plan or a suicide or if they have a suicide attempt or a specific plan of coming suicide. Now, to meet the diagnos diagnosis of depression, these symptoms must cause the individual significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. And the symptoms must also not be a result of substance use or other medical conditions. And so it really takes um, it, a, a medical specialist to really tease out which symptoms are due to Parkinson's and which may be due to depression itself. Um, so what it takes is at least um, a depressed mood, loss of interest or pleasure, and then um, at least five or more of those symptoms. So the timeline has to fit, and then the most important thing is how significantly it's impacting your ability to function. <coughs> And so when we say ability to, um, profound ability, I'm sorry, um, the impact on social, occupational, or other functioning may be just your ability to uh, function within your family. It may be a, a function, ability to function at your occupation and just within your own um, network of friends. 
Does that make sense? Okay. So some people can have one or two of those symptoms, but not necessarily the whole disorder. And that was the reason why I wanted to put all of those symptoms there, just for your, just to help explain what I'm talking about when I when I speak about major depressive disorder or um, depression. Okay, depression can happen at any time, from the premotor stage, so before Parkinson's disease may even be diagnosed, to the late stages of the disease. And the, some, the most common symptoms, as I've mentioned already, may be apathy. Donia. Some people have a lot of somatic symptoms, and what that means is they may have physical symptoms of pain, may have a lot of um, energy loss, and then neurovegetative symptoms such as fatigue, difficulty with concentration, that indecisiveness, and also problems with sleep. Um, and then suicidal ideation. Some people do have suicidal thoughts. Um, it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean that they'll carry it out, but they just may feel so hopeless that they have, they have a lot of thoughts that, you know, maybe things will be better if, if they weren't, um, they weren't here. It's more out of frustration sometimes. The risk factors for depression in this population are higher in women, it appears. There are it appears to be higher in um, those with more severe motor symptoms of Parkinson's. It also appears to be more higher in people that have more complications with their disease, or fluctuations um, of their motor, more, like more complications in their illness. Those that have more decline in their cognition, um, and that those that's, that um, experience dementia. And, many, and those that have may, may have had a psychotic episode. Anxiety plays a huge role. Anxiety is extremely distressing and um, can also lead to depression and contribute to depression. And then of course sleep disorders play into anxiety and also depression as well. As you can see, there's a big interplay between some of these things. So why are depression and anxiety undertreated? Does anyone have any, does anyone want to contribute to why they think this may be undertreated? I do. Um, Kelly. When we first got brought together to plan this session, I wanted to name this uh, uh, the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. So often people don't want to talk about it, so that's why it's undertreated. We want to share the fact that there are these complications when it comes to Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. So Kelly, just to repeat the comment, Kelly's, Kelly described depression and, and anxiety as the elephant in the room, and that it's commonly something that is not a topic that is popular or that wants to be brought up. Um, and that, and I would say, is common, uh, unfortunately, in general, and not not just in the in in Parkinson's population, but also in general, unfortunately. And being Mental Health Week, I think it's appropriate to bring this up, um, that uh, a lot of times it's due to stigma. It's due to the fact that we, uh, we, don't, we feel that maybe if we, we complain about feeling low, that someone might judge us. That maybe, um, maybe it, we should just, you know, put up with it and it'll get better and, and you know, it's not our place to complain. Maybe it's a generational thing. Um, you know, it's just, it's just not something that we were brought up to complain about. Um, sometimes the worst stigma, it comes from ourselves. And it's not necessarily from other people, it's from ourselves. And we do not do ourselves any help or any justice when we, when we do that. Um, so, all I, can, all, all I can say is that it is a huge component of the illness and it, it needs to have as much attention, just as much attention as the other motor symptoms and non-motor symptoms as, um, um, and, and, and it's just a fact. Um, I think it's also easier, there's a lot of symptom overlap with depression and anxiety 
and I think it takes a lot of time and effort to tease out what is and isn't a depressive symptom. And sometimes we get so busy and sometimes it really takes a specialist to help help get in in and and carve out what is contributing from one disorder and to another. And the medications get complicated that sometimes it's just a matter of also time and commitment from our healthcare professionals as well. Um, and sometimes we just don't report symptoms that maybe we're experiencing. So those are, those are my thoughts, um, but I'm sure there are many others as well. Why does depression occur? Well, I've already alluded to the fact that we know it happens. It's been happening since the very beginning of time. Um, the, the diagnosis, the, the disease has been around. We don't know exactly why it happens in Parkinson's or um, outside of Parkinson's. There's lots of, of reasons that are, are lots of theories. Um, number one, genetics. Genetics play a huge role um, as to why some people might be predisposed to depression and, and why some may not. Um, there's also a reactive component to the illness that when you're faced with a diagnosis for the first time that there might it might be more likely that you may face um, and when you're told your diagnosis that there might be um, there might be some hopelessness that that occurs and, and so there might be um, that might be a reason why um, it might come on at that time. There might be an inflammatory risk component that is part of depression. It's a big theory that's been ongoing for some time. Um, and the inflammation that's involved with maybe why Parkinson's happens in the first place might be a contributing reason to depression. And then um, the, the neuro, the chemicals and, the, and the, the neurotransmitters involved with Parkinson's itself actually have a very key role in depression, and so when we're playing, um, kind of playing around with the the same chemicals that treat Parkinson's disease, um, affect depression too. And so there's 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 a bit of balancing act when it comes to um, um, the brain, and there's a bit of give in one way, and and unfortunately there's a bit of compensation that happens and. So sometimes the medications we use for one condition can sometimes worsen another condition. We see that a lot with um, Parkinson's disease and schizophrenia or psychosis. We also see that sometimes with anxiety and depression too. Okay. Um, and why is it important to detect depression and treat it? Because it has a huge impact on quality of life, um, not only on yourself, if you have the illness, I think somebody got abducted. That's the emergency alert system, and it's working. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's Yay. great. <laughs> what a good timing. Okay. <laughs> I got it too. Everyone got it. You all good? Yeah, yeah. No, I'll just stay down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So depression, I feel like I have sunglasses on. <laughs> depression has a huge impact on quality of life. Huge impact. Um, not only in Parkinson's, but in everybody. And it's associated with poor outcomes. It means that if you have, for instance, if you have diabetes and you have depression, you're less likely to have good control of your diabetes. If you have heart disease and you have depression, you're less likely to have a, a live as long um, due to, your, to your, your heart. And if you have Parkinson's disease it's, and you have depression, it's less likely that you're going to have a smooth of a disease over time. It just is a fact that you will have better control of your illness if you are in a better state of mind. And so that's why we want to treat it if it's there. And um, the long, so that's, that's basically it in a nutshell. Um, we, we want your days to be brighter and, and that 
that's the whole point of finding finding it if it's present, treating it, um, and treating it as best we can, not just kind of putting a little band-aid on. We want to treat it to its the best ability that we can and um, without causing harm because it's tricky sometimes. Some of the medications that we we may have for depression also may not really be the easy to use with Parkinson's disease, so we have to be careful and choose really safe medication and, um, and monitor you really carefully. But make sure that you do get the best, um, best care possible. But it's easy, with depression, it's easier to treat the earlier it's detected. The longer that you go with, with depression and being untreated, the harder it is to treat. And so that's why um, I really strongly advocate Vigilant today. Okay. <laughs> so how could diagnosis be improved? So being proactive. And what does that mean? I try to tell every patient <clears throat> we have to be strong advocates for our own health. And it's really hard to do that. Um, but we have to. You know, we have to be, we have to go into the doctor's office and, and advocate for ourselves and say, you know what, I want to be checked out for this because I want, I want to make sure that I don't have this. Um, because not everybody keeps track of things the way we want them to. Um, we can't just make assumptions that everybody's has time to make sure that they're, you know, everything is checked um, to the best ability. And everybody's so busy. Um, I mean, it would be great if, if that happens. And there are some amazing physicians out there um, but it would be great if we just had our own way of making sure that everything is being, being checked on. And I think this organization is amazing because you have so many great resources and you're, you're making sure that you're educating. Um, yeah, I really give you guys credit. When I went through your, your website, there were so many amazing resources. I thought, what can I add to this, really? There's so many great resources. It's just a matter of keeping up with Keeping up with it and making sure that you're checking regularly to make sure that um, that you know you're um, that everything is is getting checked on a regular basis. So what I suggest is you know when you see your neurologist or when you see your family physician to just to ask about um, being screened for depression. And a lot of family doctors are doing that regularly anyway, um, especially in any patients that have chronic illness. So um, it's just important. Or if you are experiencing any of the symptoms that I described, to, to bring it up and, and sit down and, and discuss it with them. Um, they're very used to having these conversations with, with people, and it's nothing to be ashamed of. Um, and more and more physicians or nurse practitioners um, are, are talking about this on a regular basis with everyone, whether it's teenagers to, to um, seniors. Now, I just thought I would outline some of the treatments for depression, just in case you're interested. But for the most part, when it comes to treating depression, it's a very individualized approach. There's no one drug that's going to be suitable for every person. Um, and it, and even then, if we were to choose a drug for you, there's a chance that first drug may not work um, very well, and we may need to choose a second drug. Um, that happens probably about two, one third of the time that we have to choose a second drug. Um, so, unfortunately, um, you know, we don't have, we don't always have the best um, way of knowing which drug is going to work. For every person. Right? There's a number of sort of factors that we play into to that goes into making those decisions. Um, but first and foremost, we have to the things that we take into consideration is safety. We we know that you may be on a number of medications already. We want to make sure that nothing that you're taking already will be compromised um, and that any of the antidepressants may not um, make any 
because some of the medications, the antidepressants, do have some motor side effects, and so we, we have to be really cognizant of that. Um, and they also can cause some sleep disturbances, so we, do, we don't want to make anything worse. Right. Um, and then, um, what else was I going to say? Um, oh, and then there, so some of the examples of antidepressants I just have on your slide here. We have a whole bunch of families of drugs. This is just kind of for your benefit. Um, and they're, they're all listed here. I don't think I need to go through all of them, but um, some of the most common ones that are used are at the top, the top two um, um, tables. So uh, they're called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, um, or the bottom one, or the second line is uh, serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Um, and then we have some other add on treatments. As well, but very carefully, some of the add on treatments can be antipsychotics, and we have to be very, 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 very careful not to use some of the antipsychotics in anyone that has Parkinson's disease because they can link, they're very, they have some very severe side effects, um, can make you very stiff very quickly. Um, the ones I've listed on the slide are the ones that are considered to be relatively safe. That's where you go. What's that? That's where you go. Just, I think just the last little bit, a little quiet. Oh, I'm sorry. Can okay. Turn up the volume a little bit. Am I fading away? Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so some of the, um, sometimes with, with the treatment of depression, we have to use more than one drug. We may have to use another drug that we add on. And sometimes that second drug may be an antipsychotic drug. Um, and I just want to emphasize that some antipsychotic drugs are very, very unsafe in patients with Parkinson's disease. And they're listed as drugs that should never be used in somebody with Parkinson's <coughs> disease. So um, the ones that I have on the slide here, um, quetiapine, aripiprazole, and brexpiprazole are generally considered to be more safe. But so we have to be very careful about any of these drugs. So. I'm not going to talk about them much. And then just the general treatment approach um, of depression is to start with a small dose, titrate very slowly. Um, <laughs> we should see some improvement even within a few weeks. Um, usually within, even within one week, two weeks, we should start seeing some progress. Um, doctors usually use scales to assess for improvement in response. If there's no improvement within two weeks, we usually do something, whether we increase the dose, add on something, um, but we generally try to titrate um, the, the regimen in order to get the best effect. Um, generally, after we've achieved response, uh, best response, we, we treat for at least one year. Sometimes we treat for longer, it depends on the patient. There are other types of treatments that don't involve drugs. Um, there's things called cognitive behavioral therapy. This is a type of psychotherapy that's delivered by a therapist or a psychologist. Um, and it involves, um, um, yeah, it, it involves the use of a, a therapist. It's very structured. It's usually a number of sessions. It's, it's problem-based, goal-oriented. Um, but it's a type of non-drug uh, approach that can be used. <coughs> I'm not, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. And there are also some other types of therapies um, that don't involve drugs. Um, one of them is called electric, electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT. This isn't meant to be scary, or, or um, I know that a lot of people get very frightened when they hear the term ECT, and it's probably from the movies, but it's actually the most effective treatment there is for, for um for depression, and, and we do use it, especially in patients that are very severely depressed, that um, are at risk um, to themselves for a number of reasons, or that cannot tolerate medications. And so we, um, we use it quite often um, in the hospitalized setting. Um, 
and I can tell you a little bit more, more about that. We also use something called repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation or RTMS um, and then deep brain stimulation which you're probably more familiar with in the context of Parkinson's disease but uh, DBS can be used for depression as well but it's under-resourced in Saskatchewan for this very reason. Um, we also always have to look for contributing medications or drugs that are, that could be causing or aggravating the situation. And so that's often a role that I play um, if I think that maybe a medication could be causing some anxiety, causing some depressive symptoms to, to make sure that we adjust the dose or take it away. Um, this, sorry, this slide's out of sequence. So, um, so ECT, um, I'm not going to talk about this in great detail. Um, it, it, it involves invoking um, a seizure. And it's done under general anesthesia, and it's generally done um, three times a week for a total of about seven, usually eight, eight to 12 treatments. Um, as I said, it's, it's done quite regularly. It is considered to be quite safe. Um, we even do it in, we even do it in, Pregnant women, it's considered to be that safe. Um, it is not scary at all. Um, if you've ever seen one, it is actually um, um, very, it, it, it's hardly scary. Um, I, I have students right now, and um, one of them went to see it yesterday, and um, because he was very interested, and it was actually quite um, underwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> that was going to be more exciting. <laughs> okay. RTMS is something that's more common um, and is done a lot more, it's much more common in Saskatchewan anyway, because we are, have funding for it in Saskatchewan. And it's done in a doctor's office. Um, it's, in, it's usually a psychiatrist, and it's a wire coil that's um, in its inside a plastic tube and it's held over the skull and it, it transmits um, um, a magnet, um, and, um, a pulse through magnetic field. And the magnetic field induces a current in a specific part of the brain. It, usually there's some mapping of the brain that's done before then. It uh, doesn't require anesthesia. It's done, the one thing, so it's not invasive but it's done frequently. So generally it's done for like five or ten minutes every day for five days in a row for five or six weeks in a row. Um, but it can be very effective for treating depression. And a lot of patients are getting this done. All right, so anxiety. I'm just moving a little bit forward here. My time is getting a little bit uh, to, the, to the end. So anxiety, um, just to shift gears a little bit, can be experienced in numerous ways, and it um, includes a feeling of being worried or concerned, overwhelmed, restless, keyed up on edge, irritable, or ruminating, or thinking about something all the time. Um, and it, it can be also experienced through what we call somatic or physical symptoms, where you can have sweating, or dizziness, shortness of breath, you can feel your heart rate increase, you can feel very tense, so your muscles can get really sore. Um, and you can have problems sleeping because you're lots of thoughts going through your mind. Anxiety can manifest differently in, in different people, but it's distressing. It's very distressing. You can also have a very specific phobia, like there could be one thing that can really scare you, like standing up in front of all of you talking. It can be very stressful and anxiety provoking. <laughs> <laughs> or it can be a small space, like going in a small bathroom or going in an elevator. Or you can, some people get very scared of being alone. They just always need to be close to someone. They always need to know that someone's near them. Um, and, or some people get very, very, very discreet episodes of severe anxiety where they just get these attacks of anxiety and it can, what we call uh, panic attacks. And they're very, very distressing. And then people sometimes get this fear of not wanting to go out or they don't want to go out, be around people because they're scared that they're going to have another one in public and they just, they have that fear of being embarrassed. Um, and there's lots of different types of disorder, like there's there's a bunch of classifications of different types of anxiety disorder. So when I, when I spoke about the DSM-5 and all those criteria for, for depression, 
and how it's characterized, there's a whole bunch of different characterizations and lists for different types of anxiety disorders. And I'm not gonna go into those, but I just want you to know that there's different kinds for different types of, of specific types of anxiety disorders. So for example, there's, um, 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 there's generalized anxiety disorder where the anxiety is just sort of like about everything. There's a, um, um, it can be like a, like a very specific anxiety or phobia. Um, it can be obsessive compulsive, more like an obsessional type thing uh, about one particular thought. Um, but anxiety symptoms are commonly accompanied by depression, so they don't always, it doesn't always just happen on its own. It, it can also happen with depression, and it can occur prior to the onset of Parkinson's disease itself, um, and it's very high prevalence. I talked about that already. And some of the risk factors, again, women seem to be high risk for everything. The onset, um, especially, and women that have an early onset of Parkinson's disease, and those that have frequent, um, or more off periods or freezing periods. And I think that's because of the panic that can ensue when, it, when off periods. Um, contributing factors can be caused by both reactions to situations or biological factors. So um, there's been lots of research focused on the reactionary nature of anxiety to um, Parkinson's disease and like worrying about the progression um, and what the future holds. Um, and also about some of the neurochemical changes that are going on. So there's lots of studying that's, that, that's ongoing. And then there's a lot of research that's been theorized that anxiety may actually represent an early um, Parkinson's disease symptom. And that's why we may see it at the early, early beginning. Um, there's also some evidence that changes in dopamine and alterations in other neurochemicals might be responsible for um, Parkinson's disease and is associated with anxiety. Um, some of the somatic symptoms and psychic symptoms, so psychological symptoms, um, include, are, are one of the factors that um, make the understanding of anxiety and Parkinson's disease so complex because it's very um, hard to distinguish between the two. Um, and then, again, um, how do we detect anxiety? It's just basically self-report. Routine screening can be used, um, so doctors have some scales they can use. There's also an official, like Parkinson's anxiety scale, but I don't know how commonly this is used in practice. Um, but it is out there. But it really depends on your self-report, and, and by explaining to your, your caregiver or care, um, and also your um, physicians, it, you know, situations that um, are troubling you or thoughts in your mind that are troubling that's where it starts, is just um, to, to start there. And then treatments for anxiety are very similar to treatments for depression. Um, but most importantly, um, uh, well, there are some, some differences. Um, we may use some very short-term medications um, to help with some, some situations that are very distressing, like for panic attacks and that sort of thing. We call these medications um, sedatives, like clonazepam or lorazepam, um, not meant to be used long term or anything, but they can be helpful in, in very um, distressing situations. We also may use things that are very specific to anxiety, like buspirone or pregabalin. Um, and we also want to rule out aggravating factors. There are some drugs that can cause some anxiety symptoms, and so uh, we need to make sure that those that isn't the case. Um, talk therapies, cognitive behavioral therapies, working with a psychologist, working with um, uh, therapists can be very, very helpful. Exercise is always, like whatever kind of exercise it can be, it will <clears throat> never be discouraged. And then mindfulness, meditation, all of those things can be very, very helpful. So in summary, um, I just really, I hope I got my point across that depression and anxiety are unfortunately very common in Parkinson's disease. They're under-recognized, they're under-treated, 
Um, they both have a profound impact on the quality of life, unfortunately, um, and they deserve more attention. And I just hope that you can, if you can take one message away from this talk, and that is to advocate for yourself or your loved ones to regularly screen for this um, and to actively seek care if, you, um, if you're worried about yourself or a loved one um, and to seek safe and effective treatment if that is the case. 45 minutes, I did it. <laughs>